Well, good evening to you. Good to see everybody this evening. Hope everyone's had a good day today. Appreciate so much each one of you coming back tonight for our evening worship service. This evening I thought that I would do something just a little bit different. I'm going to give you an overview or a survey of the entire Bible. Now, don't worry. We are not going to cover all 66 books of the Bible tonight. My intention is to cover this over about four separate lessons. Several years ago, I did a series of lessons that I entitled A Journey Through the Bible. And we went very in-depth in that study and spent close to a year uh, working our way through the Bible. Well, this is going to be a more condensed version of this. And the reason that I wanted to cover this subject is because I know from personal experience there are some of the books of the Bible that we really don't spend that much time with. There are some that we don't know that much information about. But the Bible tells us that all Scripture comes from the inspiration of God and that it is profitable. So everything that we find contained in the pages of God's Word is beneficial to us. And it is worthy of our time and of our study. Tonight we're going to look at some of the books of the Old Testament. We're going to begin at the beginning in the book of Genesis. And my hope is that we will get through the book of Song of Solomon this evening. Now kind of as an introduction for us this evening, the Bible covers a period of time beginning about the year 4000 B.C., and carrying us through 100 A.D. It consists of 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. It was written over a time period of about 1,600 years. Roughly 40 different authors writing in three different languages on three different continents. And somehow, all of these books harmonize with each other. That is further proof to us that indeed the Bible is the Word of God. Because if this was simply a work of man, and they were functioning based upon their remembrances and on their knowledge, there would be errors. There would be contradictions. You know, we remember, or some of us remember from when we were young, oftentimes in school, we would do that little exercise where we would sit in a circle and we would start out with some type of a message and we would tell that message to the person next to us. And we were supposed to pass that all the way around until it came back to the one that it began with. Well, most of the time, by the time it came full circle, the message was entirely different. It had nothing whatsoever to do with what that message started with. Well, some of that, I'm sure, was from intentional deception. But part of it also is we tend to elaborate things. We tend to change things up whenever we base things upon our own understandings and on our own knowledge. But the Bible is something that has stood the test of time, both historically and scientifically. It has been proven to be true time and again. Now the Bible can be divided up into nine different categories. It starts out with what's commonly called the Pentateuch or the books of the law, the first five books of the Bible, that being Genesis through the book of Deuteronomy. And then we read about the history of Israel. We find this in the next 12 books of the Old Testament, starting with Joshua and ending with Esther. Then we get into books of poetry or of wisdom. And in these we find five books, starting with Job and going through Song of Solomon. We have the books of the major prophets, Isaiah through Daniel, the minor prophets, Hosea through Malachi. Then we come into the New Testament. And generally, on the part of most children of God, the majority of our knowledge of the scriptures is going to be based upon the New Testament. That's where we spend most of our time in our studies, and rightfully so, because that is the law that we're living under. That is what we are basing our lives upon. We come into the New Testament, we find the Gospels, Matthew through John. We find one book of history 
in the New Testament, that being the book of Acts, chronicling for us the early days of the church. We find the epistles, 21 books from Romans through Jude, and one book of prophecy, the book of Revelation. But tonight, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Let's go back to the book of Genesis. This word Genesis literally means beginnings. And it is a book of beginnings. And it, start, it begins with these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now this great book records the creation of mankind. It records the fall of mankind. But just some interesting facts about this book. The book of Genesis covers roughly 2,500 years of history. Almost half of all of the history that we find in the pages of God's Word is chronicled in this one book. The period of time that this covers is what is known as the patriarchal dispensation. It starts at the time of creation and it goes through the time when the children of Israel are in slavery in Egypt. We read about several interesting characters. We read about the creation of man when God created man and woman in the form of Adam and Eve. We read about the sin when they ate of the forbidden fruit and sin entered into the lives of mankind. But we find that immediately God began to give some little hints to prophesy that he was going to make it possible for mankind to be back in a redeemed state once again. We see the first of those prophecies in Genesis 3 and verse 15, where it says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Well, as time went by, all of mankind, with the exception of one family, reached the point where their thoughts were on evil continuously. And so God made the decision that he was going to destroy all but this one family. And we find the amazing account of the building of Noah's Ark and how his family, Noah's family, was spared from that destruction that came to all of mankind. We read about Abraham and how God called him out of his home country, out of the Ur of the Chaldees, and told him that he was going to make him the father of a chosen nation. He allowed Abraham to see the promised land that was going to become the inheritance of his descendants. And through his grandson, Jacob, the twelve tribes of Israel came into existence. But one of his sons, a young man by the name of Joseph, was betrayed by his brothers, was sold into slavery, and he ended up being the second in command over Egypt. And as a result of God's providence, and certainly we see the providence of God working in all of these accounts, we see that the children of Israel came to dwell there in the land of Egypt. And this was a blessing, at least at first, to this nation, because a great famine was taking place in the promised land. And they were able to come to Egypt and there they were able to be provided for. Well, over time, they were enslaved. And whenever we come into the second book, the book of Exodus. Exodus literally means a departure or a going out. This covers about a 200 year period from the birth of Moses to the time of the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness. We read about the birth of Moses, and we talked about this quite in depth in our lesson this morning, so we're not going to go into this in much depth. But we see that when Moses reached the age of 80 years, God came to him and issued quite a challenge to him. He said, I want you to go back to Pharaoh. Now you need to understand that at this time in history, Pharaoh was the most powerful man on the face of this earth. He was the head of the most powerful nation at that time. And he tells this man, a man who really was a refugee from Egypt who had fled for his life, and he tells him, you need to go back to Egypt, you need to go before Pharaoh, and you need to tell him, set your slaves free. This was quite a task. Quite a challenge. 
And after some coaxing, Moses finally agrees to do this. He goes back to Egypt and he goes before the Pharaoh. And he he basically commands the Pharaoh to let his people go. Well, Pharaoh, initially, he gave no thought to this. Who was this one man? Who was this God that he was speaking of? Why should the most powerful man on earth honor this man's wishes? Well, after ten plagues, the last being the death of the firstborn, including the death of the firstborn son of Pharaoh, we see that he finally relented. Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt where they had been for quite some time, for hundreds of years at this point. But it doesn't take long for Pharaoh to change his mind. The children of Israel, they make it to the shores of the Red Sea and they turn and they look back. And they see the army of Pharaoh coming up behind them. They look in front of them and they see water. They look to the sides and they see mountainous cliffs, areas where they could not travel. They look behind them and they see they can't retreat because the Egyptians are there. So Moses, along with the Lord's help, parts the waters of the Red Sea. The children of Israel are able to cross on dry land. Well, the Egyptians see what is taking place and they continue in pursuit. They go down into the sea. And the waters close back in upon them, and they lose their lives. Well, Moses and the children of Israel make their way to Mount Sinai. Moses goes up on the mountain, and their God provides him with tablets of stone. And on those tablets of stone are the Ten Commandments. But while Moses is on the mountain, the people begin to turn away from God. They begin to practice idol worship. They craft a golden calf. They're worshiping this idol. Well, as Moses comes down from the mountain and he sees what the people are doing, he casts down these tablets of stone, breaking them into pieces. And we remember he goes down and he grinds up the golden calf and requires the people to consume the gold that was made out of that calf. He then goes back up on the mountain and receives a second set of tablets We also find in the book of Exodus instructions on the building of the tabernacle. We find the beginning of the practice of the Sabbath day. And we even find God providing them with food, providing them in the form of food as manna. But yet the people continued to murmur, continued to complain. They were never happy with the things that they were receiving. Then we come to the book of Leviticus. Folks, Leviticus is a very tedious book to read. And the reason that is, is because it is a book containing ceremonial laws that regulated everything from the priesthood to worship in the tabernacle to sacrifices, feast days, many other aspects of life for the children of Israel living under the law of Moses. But the main thought behind this book is found in Leviticus chapter 11. We read in verses 44 and 45 where God says, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This book and the laws that are contained therein is a call to the children of Israel. It is a challenge to them to be holy, to live lives of faithful devotion to God. Then we come to the book of Numbers. And the book of Numbers is so named because there were two times in the history of the children of Israel, at least during this period, that a census was taken of the people. The first was at the time of the exodus from Egypt, and the second was at the end of their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. The main message that we see in this book deals with those 40 years in the wilderness. The things that led up to this, the things that transpired over that time. Well, this book records how the children of Israel were preparing themselves for war. 
They knew that once they got to the promised land, they were going to have to fight to conquer that place in order for it to become their home. Well, when they get to the border of the promised land, there were some spies, 12 men. They were sent into the land to go and look it over, to see what they could see, to see what they were going to be up against. Well, when they came back, Ten of those men said, there is absolutely no way we can do this. There's giants in the land. We can't go up against these people. We, just, we cannot do it. But there were two of these spies, Joshua and Caleb. And they said, with the Lord's help, we can take it. With the Lord on our side, we can go up and we can take this land. Well, you can guess who the people supported. They didn't go along with the two. They went along with the ten. And as a result of this, God made a decree, made a decision at that point that other than Joshua and Caleb, that every male over the age, look at this, over the age of 20, every male of that generation would die before they would be allowed to enter the promised land. So what happened was for roughly another 38 years, they wandered around the wilderness, moving from place to place. Now during this time, they encountered some pretty interesting things. They faced fiery serpents. They were fed with so much quail. Now listen to this. With such a massive amount of quail that God said that it was going to run out of their noses. Quite a picture, isn't it? They saw the earth open up and swallow people that were in rebellion to God. But it's also during this time that we're introduced to a man by the name of Balaam. And what we know about this man, he had a talking donkey. That would have been quite a, quite a sight to see. Then we come to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy literally means second law. This does not mean that a new law was being established. It simply means that this is a restatement of the law of Moses. And the reason why this was necessary was because a new generation had arisen. Those who were uh, of age, those who were considered the leaders of the people at the time that the law was initially given, they had all died in the wilderness. And now a new generation had arisen and they needed to be taught these things. They needed to be reminded what was expected by those living under the law of Moses. Well, God gave the children of Israel a total of 613 individual commands that they were to follow. 613 individual laws. And we have to remember that the law of Moses was based upon the letter of the law. If they were not faithful in even one of these 613 areas, then they were out of favor with God. In this book, we find 248 times where God says, you shall. These are things that you shall do. We find 365 times where God says, you shall not. Things that they were commanded not to do. And these things pertain to everything from their diets to diseases to purification to marriage. So many different aspects of their life were covered by these laws that were there. Also in this book we find Moses giving his farewell address. We remember that it was revealed to him that because of the sin, the sin that he had committed that he would not be allowed to enter into the promised land. He gives his farewell address to the people. But he also warns this nation about what they were coming out of. He warns them about the rebellion of their fathers and the importance of remaining faithful to God. And at the end of this book, Joshua is chosen as the new leader of the people and Moses dies. Now we look at the 12 books of history. These books, Joshua to Ezra, cover about a thousand years from the year 1450 B.C. to 400 B.C. 
The book of Joshua is so named because it covers about a 50-year period of time when Joshua was the leader of the children of Israel. He was the one that led them into the land of Canaan. He was the one that was leading them as they conquered that land, as they made their home in this place. This book starts with Joshua stepping up to take charge, taking over for Moses, who had just recently died. And we find some wonderful instructions that God gives to Joshua in the first chapter of this book. Starting in verse 5, it says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do all or according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success." Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Well, after this, Joshua and the children of Israel, they cross the Jordan River. They go into the land of Canaan, and they carry out three major military efforts. And in these campaigns that they engage, they engage 30 different enemy forces. I want you to think about this concept for just a minute. Here you have one small group of people coming in and facing many forces that seemingly were superior to them. But 30 forces were driven out of the land. They overcome them in battle. But they learned the hard way that their victories only came when they remain faithful to God. For whenever they allowed sin to enter into the camp, they were no longer successful. Whenever they no longer were doing as the Lord commanded, they began to fail. But as long as they kept an obedient faith in God, they were successful in all of their endeavors, regardless of how daunting that task may seem. They were successful. Well, after having driven these enemy forces from the land, the land is divided up among those 12 tribes of Israel. But interestingly, three of those tribes, Reuben, Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh chose to make their home somewhere else. They chose not to live in the promised land, but to make their home back on the other side of the Jordan River. Then we come to the book of Judges. Judges covers about a 300-year period of time, and it shows what happens when you lack good leadership. After Joshua died, the children of Israel's devotion to God began to go downhill. In Judges 17 and verse 6, it describes what the problem took place, what the problem was. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right. In his own eyes. You know that kind of sounds like our country today doesn't it? Because what is it that we're being told? We're being told that everything is subjective. That there is no right. There is no wrong. That you develop your own code of morality. You develop your own ideologies. You live your life however you want to live it. Well folks what is happening is everyone is doing what seems right in their own eyes. Well, this book covers seven cycles of sin. And each time the children of Israel fell into sin, God allowed an enemy force to come in and oppress the children of Israel. But it also records the people's repentance and God allowing them to be relieved from that oppression. This took place through 15 different individuals. Fifteen judges that were allowed to rise to power. The children of Israel would fall into sin. They would become oppressed by an enemy force. 
They would realize the need to repent. A judge would rise to power that would lead them in overcoming that force. But then they would fall away again. And what we see in the book of Judges is kind of like a yo-yo. It's a back and forth effect. Periods of faithfulness going into periods of unfaithfulness time after time. And this cycle was one that continued throughout this 300-year period of time until finally we come to the last judge, that being a man by the name of Samuel. But before we move on into the next period of history, we find a little book included in this, uh, in this section of books that records an occurrence that took place during the time of the judges. It's a love story, and once again, we talked about this in our lesson this morning. So we're not going to go very in-depth into this book, but the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth, as I said, is a love story. It covers about ten years of time. And you may remember as we discussed this morning, there was a famine in the land, and Naomi and her family, they moved to Moab. And while they were there, her sons married Moabite women. But then her husband and both of her sons passed away, and she decided to return back home. But she had a daughter-in-law that no matter what she said, no matter what kind of encouragement that she gave to her to stay in Moab, to go back to her home, she would not leave her mother-in-law. And she went back home with her mother-in-law, went back to Judah, and there she met a man by the name of Boaz. She married Boaz after following the guidance that Naomi gave to her. And she went on to become a part of the lineage of Christ. She became the great-grandmother of David. Then we come to the books of First and Second Samuel. First and Second Samuel originally were one book. And it covers a time period from about 1171 B.C. to 1015 B.C. First Samuel covers the history of two judges, Eli and Samuel. It also covers the anointing of the first king of Israel. Now remember, this was not God's plan. God was not in favor of them having a king. But they began to clamor against the judges. They wanted a king like the nations that were around them. And Samuel, being distraught, he goes before God wanting to know what he needs to do. Why have the people rejected him? And you remember the words of encouragement that God gave to Samuel. He says, Samuel, they have not rejected you. They've rejected me. They rejected God's will, rejected his leadership. And even though God warned them, you're not going to be happy with a king. He still relented and allowed them to have a king. And in the book of 1 Samuel, we read about Saul, the exploits that he went through as he was a king. We read about him being overthrown. But we also read some very interesting accounts. One of the most well-known stories from the book of 1 Samuel, David and Goliath. David's defeat of this giant and his success in battle against other forces. His friendship with Jonathan, Saul's jealousy of David. And then it also records Saul's failure to keep God's word and the death of Saul and also of Jonathan. 2 Samuel covers the reign of David. David became king at the time of the death of Saul and during this time he enlarged the kingdom. But it also covers the dark side of David's life. It covers the sins that he became involved in. The committing of adultery, the putting to death of Bathsheba's husband. It also talks about the consequences of the sins that he engaged in. But it also tells us about the sins of his children, and about the rebellion and the death of his son Absalom. And then the books of 1 and 2 Kings, like 1 and 2 Samuel, they were originally one book as well. And they record the history of the Israelites from where 1 and 2 Samuel left off. And these books cover the period of time from David's death to about the year... Uh, 586, about the time of Jerusalem's destruction. 1 Kings records where David is nearing the end of his life and he names Solomon to be the next king. 
It records all that Solomon did to expand that kingdom. But it also records his downfall. And we remember what his downfall was. He decided he needed 700 wives and 300 concubines. And that led to his downfall for his wives turned him away from God. Then we read of Solomon's son Rehoboam. Solomon passes away. Rehoboam is the rightful heir to the throne. But instead of seeking the wise counsel of older men, he goes to his peers and they encourage him to oppress the people. Well, the people were not going to go along with this and it led to ten tribes breaking off. And they went to the north and they established a new kingdom that they called Israel. And very quickly after doing this, they went to the cities of Dan and Bethel. And there they erected idols and began to practice idolatry. These two remaining tribes, Judah and Benjamin, they remained in this southern kingdom. They came to be known as Judah. Second Kings continues to record this history. It talks about the kings that reigned over these divided kingdoms. Israel did not have a single good king. Their demise was one that was much swifter. For in 721 B.C., the Assyrians came in. They destroyed Israel. They carried them away into captivity. Now, Judah was a little bit better off. They had some good kings, but ultimately, their decline into deprivation they began to uh, turn away from God, and the Babylonians came in in 588 or 586 BC, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, and carried many of the people away into Babylonian captivity. Some of the people that we read about uh, during this time were prophets Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. First and Second Chronicles also at one time was. Uh, the same book, and it's basically a supplement to what we find in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. It gives us a brief history from Adam to Solomon through the genealogy of the Israelites. But the reason this is done is so that when they re were released from Babylonian captivity, they would be able to go back to Jerusalem. And they would be able to reestablish themselves. They would know what their history was. They would know where they came from. Well, after 70 years in Babylonian captivity, they began to be allowed to go back home. And we read in the book of Ezra of the first two waves of people that were allowed to return back. The first was with a man by the name of Zerubbabel. And he took 30,000 people with him from Babylon back to Judah. And there he was supposed to get to work rebuilding the walls and rebuilding the temple. Well, after a while, it was reported that this was not being done. The work was not getting completed. And so Ezra brought 2,000 Jews back with him. And they began to perform the work of rebuilding the walls and rebuilding the temple and restoring the worship to God, restoring the observance of the law of Moses. But an interesting side note, it was during this time that these two tribes of Judah and Benjamin were in Babylonian captivity that they started to refer to themselves as Jews. Prior to this time, they were not known by that title. And so often, as we go back and as we read through the Old Testament, oftentimes we will use the terms Hebrew, Israelite, and Jew in an interchangeable way. But there's some very marked differences in those two categories. A Hebrew was anyone that was a descendant of Abraham. And so we find that both the descendants of Isaac and the descendants of Ishmael could rightfully be referred to as Hebrew. Israelites were anyone that was a descendant of Jacob. But then we come to this subject of the Jews. This name originated from the tribe of Judah. 
which was the predominant tribe that remained there in that southern kingdom. Benjamin was a very small tribe, and it was one that was usually paired together with Judah uh, for form for different uh, government affairs and things of that nature. And so while they were there in Babylon, they came to refer to themselves as Jews. And from this point forward, this became the predominant term that was used for these people, for these individuals. The book of Nehemiah covers about a 13-year period. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king, and he made a very bold decision that he was going to go back to Jerusalem, and he was going to make sure that the walls were going to be rebuilt. He was going to make sure that things were going the way that they needed to be going. Well, he got there, he got to work, he took a full military escort with him, They rekindled the Jews' faith in God. But then Nehemiah left, and they began to turn away from God again. Nehemiah returned for a time and brought them back to a position of righteousness. Well, this brings us to the end of recorded history in the Old Testament. We find about a 400-year period of silence from the time that this book ends until the time that the Gospels open. And I think this is a good place for us to stop tonight. I wanted to get a little bit further, but we've run out of time for tonight. And we'll pick back up with this, uh, with this lesson again. Uh, it'll be in two weeks. Next week is our question and answer night. And I hope everyone that is able to plans to be here for that. We always really enjoy those nights, having those times to look at the questions that you have submitted uh, and hope that if there are any questions that you have in mind, things that you've wondered about, that you'll submit those and we'll be glad to answer those at that time. But tonight it may be that something has been said tonight or maybe even from the lesson this morning that you've been thinking about through the day that has led you to realize that there is something in your life that is just not right, something that is amiss, that there are corrections that need to be made. Well, we want to extend an opportunity for you to make your life right tonight. If you examine yourself and you find that as a child of God, you're not living your life as you should, you've strayed away from God, and you've allowed sin to come back into your life, then we would encourage you tonight, come forward and make that known and be restored to the faith. Or it may be that there is someone here that has never obeyed the gospel, that has never become a child of God. Well, we encourage you tonight that if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that you will turn away from your sins. Come forward, confess that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and be baptized. Have your sins washed away, be added to the church by the Lord. Begin living a faithful Christian life. Tonight, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we encourage you to come at this time while together we stand and sing.